There's so much to learn when you get a new RV, and it can be really overwhelming. Hi, I'm Jen Grover, and on this week's episode of Tab Talk, I'm going to share 10 more things that new owners do wrong when they start camping. Stay tuned. Before I jump into this week's content, I just want to recognize that, yes, this is my third video in this series of the 10 things tab owners do wrong. And what I've learned is that these things apply to tab owners, tag owners, ta-da owners, and even owners of other trailers. There are a lot of simple mistakes that new RVers make. And the reason the tab seems to pop out with their mistakes is because we have so many first time campers. It's a natural upgrade from tent camping. And so there's a lot to learn. You don't need to be overwhelmed. I'm gonna share 10 more things that you may do wrong when you start camping to help save you from making the same mistakes others have made. If you like my content, I appreciate it. If you do hit the like button, if you subscribe, when you click the little bell that's below the video, you'll see that you can be notified when a new video is posted. And also, if you're interested in my content, you can follow me on social media. I'm at Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, of course, as Jen Grover Photography. In addition to social media, I do have a website with a frequently asked questions section about the tab, and also numerous blog posts about things like power consumption, your batteries, solar, how to save water when you're dry camping and boondocking, and other useful information. That website is jengrover.com. Now let's jump into this week's content. A lot of times people are so excited to get their trailer and head home, they don't stop to think about hitch height and how that impacts their ability to drive level. So when I mean level, I mean that either the tongue of the trailer, this hand's the trailer, is either up or down. And that's because they need to measure from the ground to the top of the ball on their hitch and it means, needs to meet the coupler height on the trailer. On a standard tab 320, the last I knew the hitch height was about 16 to 17 inches from the ground to the top of the ball. On a tab 320 boondock, it was about 21 inches. It's important to measure from the ground to the top of the ball. If you don't have the right hitch height, you'll need to pick up a hitch that has either a drop or a raise. And those drops and raises usually come in two inch increments. You can also get an adjustable hitch height so that there's like a pin that locks it in and it slides it up and down. And I did have one of those, but I found it much heavier and more cumbersome. So once you've got it dialed into the right hitch height, make sure you have the one that meets your needs. Bear in mind, if you have a vehicle that has auto leveling or air suspension that adjusts when you get in and out of the vehicle, you may actually have to turn the vehicle on to get an accurate read on your hitch height. On my Grand Cherokee, I use a four inch drop. Another common question or error that I see people make is around the tow capacity of their vehicle compared to the weight of the trailer. And the tab is such a lightweight trailer and it doesn't require a big vehicle to tow it with. But you'll see people trying to skate in with about 2,700 pounds of towing capacity. And if you have a Dutchman tab with no bathroom and the aluminum frame, you probably can get away with that. Um, I personally wouldn't, but you probably could, especially if you don't go to the mountains. If you have a newer tab, especially the ones with the bathroom um, that are around 2,000 to 2,200 pounds, I don't remember the exact number off the top of my head, you're not going to want to tow with a 2,700 pound tow capacity, especially if it has a CVT transmission. You're really, by the time you add your own cargo, you're really at the limit and you're not going to have a good towing experience. The best case scenario, if you're towing close to capacity, is that you go slow and you can't really keep up with traffic going up steep inclines. Worst case scenario, you're actually hurting your transmission or your engine. So, it, you know, there we could have a whole debate about tow capacities on vehicle. I think 3,500 pounds is in the lowest I would tow with. Um, to be honest with you, you're going to get a much better towing experience if you get a vehicle that tows around 4,500 pounds or more. Um, I personally, my tow vehicle has 6,200 pounds and it's a dream to tow with. I tow, tow with a Grand Cherokee. I've had two Grand Cherokees and I'm on my third 
which is a Grand Cherokee L. So it's a little bigger than the two previous, but I really don't notice any difference between the Grand Cherokee and the L other than I'm getting a little better gas mileage. The third thing people forget to do when they first start camping is the annual maintenance, especially when it comes to inspecting the caulking. All trailers have flex, so that caulk isn't going to last forever, especially when you've got heat or dry conditions, it's going to crack easier. But there's flex in the trailer by design because you don't want it to not have flex, um, especially under the door. You want to look on a tab and then around the wheel wells and then around the lights and the fan. In addition to that, you want to make sure that you check your window seals um, to make sure that they're good and that the windows are solid. And the other things like bearing maintenance and tires, you're going to want to do inspections of those annually and follow New Camp's recommendation. But a lot of people don't realize that you do need to check the caulking specifically. So make sure you stay on top of that. Read your owner's manual from New Camp because they do address it. Which leads me to the fourth thing that people don't do when they start camping. And that's keep an eye on their tires, especially the tire pressure. You really need to be checking your tire pressure on a daily basis. Now you can do that with the old fashioned tire gauges. A digital tire gauge makes it a little easier to read. Um, and then of course you can invest in a tire pressure monitoring system. Up until this year, I have been using just the old fashioned tire gauges. Um, I have, they're, they're even, um, they're digital, but they just go into the tire, I check the pressure, and then I add air with a Ryobi tire inflator. I have just picked up, not installed or reviewed yet, the a T TPMS or a tire pressure monitoring system that'll go on my tab tires. And that will help me keep up to up to date with my tire pressure and make sure that I'm never at a low low tire pressure or high tire pressure, and especially if there are sudden changes. The setup I have actually has real-time monitoring, so if something were to change while I'm driving, whether it be the heat or the tire pressure, it would give me a notification. And once I've had a chance to use it, I'll do a review on that and let you know how I like it. But, you know, you may be wondering, how did I keep up with tire pressure monitoring while I was towing? Well, the first thing I did is I check the tire pressure and you should always check your tire pressure when it's cold or when you haven't towed yet. So I check it first thing in the morning before I leave. And if I'm on a multi-day trip, I did that every day of my trip because you really need to be in tune with your tire pressure while you're traveling. I started noticing issues with tire pressure um, leaking air when I got to the North Rim of the Grand Canyon once and I monitored it. And by the time I got to Zion, that tire was flat. So I was able to get roadside assistance right at the campground in Zion and have it taken care of. The next thing people don't do with new tires or a new trailer is torque their lug nuts properly. You're supposed to do that at 10, 25, and 50 miles when you first pick up the trailer or when you replace the tires. Read your manual because there have been some tire pressure changes. I know for my 2021, the manual said 90 foot pounds of pressure on each lug nut. And when you go to tighten them, you'll want to use a torque wrench with a three quarter inch socket. And I recommend getting a deep socket on the end of that torque wrench and you'll tighten them in a star pattern. And if you're changing tires, you'll want to do the same thing. Make sure you talk to the tire installer because if you don't, they'll probably just use an impact gun and they won't be torqued properly. Now, why is this important? This is important because when you don't torque properly, it puts undue stress on your lug nuts and they can actually shear off while you're driving and you'll lose a tire, have to replace the hub or even the whole axle. And that's neither cheap nor convenient when you're traveling. If your wheel flies off like that, you could do some serious damage to your wheel well and potentially other parts of the trailer as well as cause an accident. So. It's, you know, don't be afraid of it. Using a torque wrench isn't difficult. You simply, um, depending on the type you get, mine, you just click it or you just dial in the pressure of foot pounds that you need to reach and you turn it until it makes a nice, loud, audible click. And then I go next in the star pattern until I'm complete. And if you Google it, you can find lots of videos on how to use a torque wrench. But um, the important thing is to make sure that you do it properly.
The sixth thing people fail to do when they start camping is understand their batteries and how much power the different things in their trailers use. It's not uncommon to hear about people camping on their first maiden voyage and they hear chirping because the carbon um, monoxide or the, the propane detector is going off, which is hardwired in all trailers, and that's because they have low battery or maybe they can't get their Aldi on, they can't run the pump, whatever it is, they've discovered they don't have enough battery left because they didn't understand that, you know, that maybe they shouldn't be running their fridge on um, battery if they have a three-way absorption fridge. But if you have a newer fridge, of course you're running it on battery. But they may run the fan exhaustively, watch TV, have all the lights on, and drain their battery right away. So I do have a lot of content on my website about understanding power consumption. I'll put a link to that up here and you can read about that, watch the video I have about power consumption. The other thing that people don't think about is that their tow vehicle may not be charging their trailer while they're driving. A lot of people, especially if they've had a vehicle that had a four pin connection, just get the seven pin connection installed and they the installer doesn't run a charge line from that seven pin connection to the battery. That's really important. You can actually test that with a multimeter or you can buy these little adapters and I'll put a link in the description below the video that you plug into your tow vehicle that helps you diagnose problems with the seven pin wiring on your tow vehicle. They also have those little adapters that you can plug into the seven pin cable on your trailer to diagnose issues. But if you get one of those little tools and plug it in, it'll show you if you have a hot charge line or not. So it's an important thing to know how much battery capacity you have and how long that's going to last you. Another thing people fail to do is to check the power at the pedestal. Now, last time I talked about they forget to turn it on. Of course, that's that's an issue. But more than that, they're plugging in they have no protection for their trailer, and they might be plugging into reverse polarity, uh, lower high voltage, or even worse, just problems that it hasn't been wired properly. If you're plugging in at somebody's house, maybe they think they have a 30 amp connection for an RV, and it's really wired for a clothes dryer, which will fry your RV if you plug into. So how can you protect it? Well, there's the basic way you can use the type of tools that an electrician might use that plugs in and makes sure it's somewhat okay. It's going to test for limited things, um, but that won't protect you while you're using the campsite. The second best thing would be to get a surge protector, which will do as you expect, protect you from a surge. Um, the third thing I recommend, which I recommend I put on both of my trailers before I even brought it home, was what's called an electrical management system or an EMS. And that is the surest way to protect your trailer from a power surge, from lower high voltage, and lower high voltage can ruin the appliances in your camper. Um, it protects you from reverse polarity. It protects you from something called RV hot skin, which can be um, the result of poor wiring at the pole. It can be a bad power cable, or your ground on your trailer could go bad and cause what's called RV hot skin, which essentially electrifies your trailer. If you ever come up to your trailer and you've got a tingling sensation, that's a problem because that means you've got RV hot skin. You could be electrocuted or even die, especially if there's water on the ground. I know I've talked with a friend who camped once in an area where his camper was surrounded by water due to heavy rain and he didn't have an EMS and it could have been really bad had there been an interruption with the ground. Um, sometimes it's called stray voltage. I've seen that term used too. But the surest way to protect your investment and yourself is an EMS. There are two major kinds out there right now. Um, there is the, I believe it's the Bulldog, which is Bluetooth. And then the brand I use is Progressive. Progressive offers a lifetime warranty. And I've read stories where they've actually replaced people's campers because the EMS failed. Um, they have an excellent reputation. Their EMSs have protected my camper several times. One from a miswired 30 amp connection by an electrician. Once from voltage fluctuations during a thunderstorm and once from reverse polarity. So it does happen if you do a lot of camping. Now, if you always boondock, maybe you think you don't need anything. 
always at minimum check the power before you plug into because I've gone to people's houses and it's been low voltage. And again, that can ruin that can ruin your appliances in your camper. So you want to protect that investment. Number eight, sometimes people don't turn the pump off when they drive. And so they're driving down the road. They've still got some fresh water in the fresh water tank. They haven't drained it. And there, something knocks their faucet and it turns on and they flooded their camper when they arrive at their campsite. So if you're not using it, it's not a bad idea to turn it off. Um, it can prevent unwanted floods regardless of your situation. In that first video, I shared how I'd left the outdoor shower on. It would have been a lot worse had I not turned the pump off. If I'd left that pump on overnight, that would have been horrible. Um, so turning the pump off, draining your tanks when you're not using them are always great ways to protect your trailer from an unintended flood. If, for example, a pipe bursts and you're not there, that all that water is going to dump into your trailer until you notice it. So turn off the pump, drain your drain your lines and your um, tanks, and you should prevent any unwanted flooding when you're traveling. It's okay to travel with water in your tanks. I do that, especially when I'm going to be overnighting at Walmart or dry camping. But if if you are traveling with water in your tanks, make sure that the pump is off. Number nine drives people crazy. It's bugs in the camper. And <laughs> it's always a little humorous when people start off freaking out with their new camper because bugs got in. A lot of times that's because they're going in and out of their camper and they're leaving the light on inside and it's dark out. That's the easiest way for bugs to get in. And, you know, bugs are a crazy thing. Sometimes you have no bugs and then the next night you realize it's they're everywhere and you can't get in and out of your camper without them getting in with you. It just happens. No matter what kind of screens you have on your camper, I've talked to all sorts of RV owners and they all have this happen. Sometimes the bugs just get in. And I'm, I'm a big fan of using the light once I'm inside. I make it a practice to not turn the lights on inside the tab until I am inside and the door is closed. And most of the time that keeps the bugs out. But those rare occasions where they sneak in, I'll simply run the fan on the exhaust at high speed for a few minutes and it seems to suck them all up. As a last resort, a handheld vacuum cleaner is a great way to get rid of the bugs. And number 10 happens usually on the maiden voyage or one of the first few trips. After a blissful night of sleep at the quiet campground, they wake up and see condensation all over the inside of their camper. And that's just because you're in this closed sort of airtight space without enough, enough ventilation. And that's going to happen in any camper. It happens in tents even. So what you'll want to do is ventilate somehow. You can open the windows to that first crack position. If you, if you don't know, there are two positions on a tab for the windows. There's a crack, which you never want to drive with it in that crack position. But you can s open it up at night so that you're letting some air in. You could put all three of your windows in a 320 in that cracked position. Um, if you're going to do that, you may want to run the fan on low. The other thing you can do is open the vent. I like to leave the vent wide open. Um, I love cold air. And so that's a great way to create ventilation. And then, of course, you can open the windows wider. But the key is you've got to provide a way to ventilate the inside of your camper. So we've shared several of these mistake lists this summer, and I know I haven't covered them all. So if you haven't already indicated what mistake you've made or what mistakes you see other people make, make sure you drop those in the comments below the video so that others can learn too. Our goal here is to help each other not make the mistakes that we've made. So if my friends have made a mistake, I try to learn from them and vice versa. We're all going to make mistakes. It makes it great when we can laugh at ourselves and share the information and learn from each other. I hope this video was helpful for you. If it was, be sure to hit the thumbs up button and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.